Hello everyone, let's uh, start our lecture today. So this is gonna be the continuation of the previous lecture. Let's uh, make a couple of important points that we had in the previous lecture. So we saw that the directivity of half a wavelength dipole is about 1.64 dimensionless or 2.15 dB or we may call it dBi. That was for half a wavelength then the directivity of uh, a full wavelength dipole is about 2.41 or 3.82 dB. So this is the two numbers that we had. And uh, so we said this is in fact, in terms of directivity is more. So you may say if, I, if you like a little bit more directivity, then this is more appropriate. But then we said this does not take into account the impedance mismatch because directivity assumes that you've already given the power to the antenna. So you deliver the power to the antenna to radiate. So it doesn't consider any issues with mismatch because if there is mismatch, you can't essentially do a good job in radiation. So this is what's missing in the directivity. As I want to repeat myself, directivity assumes that you already have that current on your antenna. So then, so this is what I'm going to discuss more in this lecture. So intuitively, we saw that if we have a, a one lambda dipole antenna, the current distribution on the dipole is like that. So if you calculate Z in, you see that this Z in is of course V divided by I at the port of the antenna because I goes to zero becomes very small, Z in goes to, let's say, infinity. Therefore, you essentially have, uh, let's call it infinity, and then you're bringing 50 ohm to infinity, so you're gonna have very huge mismatch. If it's infinity, uh, reflection is 100%. So therefore, this is going to be a problem in terms of um, impedance mismatch. And remember, directivity doesn't take this into account. Directivity assumes that you have this current on the dipole antenna. So, so this is one thing that you need to be careful. But when you go to half a wavelength dipole, we saw that this is the current distribution. So now you have this as I naught. So you essentially had Z in equal v divided by i naught so i naught as of course is not zero so therefore you get a reasonable z in and we saw that this is 73 plus j 42.5 and we said that if we cut it a little bit this we can make this zero and then you can end up with something about 73 and this 73 give us a good reflection coefficient which was acceptable we saw that in the previous lecture now, something I want uh, to uh, discuss in this lecture is that if you look at the radiation, if you calculate radiation resistance of these two antenna, you get a radiation resistance, which is about 73 ohm for this. And then if I tell you what is the R in, so remember Z in consists of real part and imaginary part, Let's call it R in plus J X in, for example. So the real part of it is R in. And if you think about R in of this dipole, that's also about 73 ohm. But now when we go to a full wavelengths, which is D naught equal lambda, then R R is about 199, but then R in is extremely large. So, Let's say it can go to infinity if I goes to zero. Now, why we have this discrepancy here? Why this RR radiation resistance correspond to this R in? But in this case, this is 199, but then we say R in goes to infinity. So to understand that, let's assume that your dipole antenna is lossless. So we don't have any loss due to meta. So then you would say if it's lossless, then what's going to happen is that the power given to the antenna would be R in, I in a square. So that's essentially the power given to the antenna. So this is, is, imagine you have R in here, the real part of the input impedance. We assume it's lossless. So if it's lossless, this is essentially going to radiate for you. So R in times I in, the, 
in I in is the current at the input port, and that should be equal to the radiated power by the antenna, which is half R R I naught square. Now, now look at what's what we have here. For the half a wavelength dipole antenna, the current at the input port here, the current at the input port is I naught. And the peak of the current on the dipole is also, that's the, by definition, I naught. So for this antenna here, the I at input port is the same as I naught. So when I in is the same as I naught, therefore you get R in equal to RR, which is this observation here. But now look at this one here. In this case, I in is essentially, I can say goes to zero, becomes very small. When I in becomes very small, so then what is I naught by the way in this case? This is your I naught, the maximum of the current on the antenna. This is I naught, but your I in at the input port becomes very small. So imagine this is a number, let's say for example, one watt, I in is very small, goes to zero, and then this multiplication should be one watt. So if this becomes very tiny, this should become very large. So that's why R in becomes very large. So that's why we have R R and R in different here. So that's, that's the situation with this type of antennas. So if I, for example, find R in from this equation, R in becomes R R, I naught square divided by I in square. So this is the, uh, the current that we're going to have. And remember, I on the dipole was I naught sine K L2 plus minus Z, depending on the top arm and bottom arm. Maybe it's better that I write it minus plus Z, because minus was for the top arm, plus was the bottom arm. At the Input port Z equals zero, so you plug Z equals zero, so you get I Z equals zero, I naught sine K L divided by two. So that's my I in. So if you plug that here, this becomes I naught square sine two K L divided by two. So that's gonna be the R in I naught and I naught cancel, therefore your R in becomes R R sine square K L divided by two. So this is essentially what we have and we can also open the sign as sine square K becomes two pi divided by lambda times L divided by two. Now for this antenna, what is L divided by two? This is L divided by two, which is lambda divided by two. Half of the length is lambda divided by two. So I can substitute that here. So it's gonna be RR sine squared two pi lambda. This is lambda divided by two. And therefore you're gonna get sine of pi, which is zero. So RR, sine a square of pi, therefore this goes to infinity. So that's why the R in of this one goes to infinity. But in this case, what is L divided by two? This is half a wavelength in total. So this is lambda by four. Now, if you substitute L divided by two lambda by four, you get, you get sine a square of 90, and therefore you get RR divided by one, which would be RR. So your R in becomes essentially RR. So this is, uh, this is what we're gonna have, and you need to be careful about the input impedance. So just don't, on, don't look at directivity only, also make sure that the input impedance is fine too. So you don't wanna have current goes to zero at the input port, otherwise uh, the input impedance becomes very large. So this is the situation that we have over here. So that's one thing I wanted to talk about. The other thing I wanted to talk about is about the directivity in general. Now, when it comes to directivity, 
with this type of antenna, if you increase the length even further, for example, let's talk about D naught 1.25 lambda. So this is now the length of the dipole. Now this time is 1.25 lambda. The directivity gets to about 3.2 dimensionless or about 5 dB directivity. So you see directivity increases and that makes sense because now you have two longer wires so you get more currents on the, on the antenna and you get more directivity. So as you increase the length, so remember the directivity of tiny antenna like an infinitesimal antenna was 1.5. So you keep increasing the length and directivity increases. And that's consistent with our understanding of antenna that the larger the antenna, generally the directivity is larger. But remember, after this point, your directivity drops. And uh, so I'm going to show you uh, the curve from the textbook later on. But uh, I'm, let me discuss that and then we look at the slide from uh, Professor Balani's textbook. But uh, the thing that you should understand here is that as you keep increasing, then the currents on the antenna doesn't stay in phase. For example, let's again look at our open-ended, so open circuit transmission line. So this is our current distribution. Now imagine I want to, for example, have 1.25 lambda in total. So remember, this is lambda plus lambda by four. So each arm would be lambda divided by 2 plus lambda divided by 8. So I need to get lambda divided by 2 and a little bit which is lambda divided by 8. So this is the point that I need to do uh, the bending. So, so this would be also the other current here. So opposite side. Now if I bend from this point here downward and upward here, this is going to be the antenna that I'm going to get. So this, if this is the current, let's say in this direction, this would be opposite. And then here, because that's going on the other direction as that, so this is going to be in this direction. And this one would be, of course, opposite to that. So if you bend this now this way, so what you're going to have would be something like this, this for this and then this for this. And then if you do the same thing with this one downward, then you're gonna get this. So now this is essentially the antenna that you're gonna have in terms of current distribution. So you see, we increase the length of the antenna, so we have these two currents in phase, but then we start having these currents that they are out of phase with respect to these currents. And they're going to have effect, effect on our radiation pattern. For example, you might see now a radiation pattern similar to this, for example. This was the, what we had before, but now you may, have, you may have this type of things too. And I'm going to show that to you later on. But this has started appearing. And if you push it more and more and more, it actually can bring the directivity down. And you start having these things. So. Uh, I think in the slide that I'm going to show you, it has 1.25 lambda, which is sort of the maximum directivity that we get. And then in the lab, you're going to see, if I'm not mistaken, 1.5 lambda by the lab volt system. So you can also check that one too, which is also very interesting. So this is regarding the current distribution that after some point, you start having currents which are not completely in phase. And remember, you can't really say this cancel this. Uh, that's not correct because remember, uh, the magnetic vector potential is mu naught 4 pi j r prime e to the power of minus j k r minus r prime r minus r prime. And it's a summation of currents, but weighted by this. So if the currents are so tiny, you can ignore that. But as I mentioned, we just do that for infinitesimal and a small dipole. But for these, uh, you can't really say, for example, this 
cancel this antenna because then the weight for them would be different. So, and the weight needs to be taken into account. And uh, we're gonna see more of that in antenna arrays. So anyways, that's, uh, that's one thing I wanted to mention. The other thing I wanted to mention at this point before showing you a couple of uh, slides was uh, the essentially the, the, the resistance due to loss because we talked about radiation resistance. Now we're gonna talk about the, uh, the resistance due to loss that's happening on the dipole antenna. Remember these dipoles antenna, if they made of perfect electric conductor, then they don't have any loss. But then if they have, if they're made of, I mean, for example, copper and things like that, the conductivity is not infinite. And therefore you're gonna get some loss associated with your antenna. So, so if, if we want to talk about that briefly, I wanna remind you that the, uh, the loss, the, the loss resistance due to loss in DC is we write it as one divided by sigma conductivity length of the wire divided by the cross section of the wire. So if this is your wire, so you have the area A, you have the length L, and then you have the sigma conductivity. So for perfect electric conductor, sigma goes to infinity. Therefore, our resistance due to loss goes to zero. So this is the equation that we have. When we go to higher frequency, we have uh, the so-called skin depths. So essentially, if this is the cross section, if you go to higher frequency, the currents are gonna be confined mainly very close to the surface. And this is related to the topic of a skin depths that you can review your previous courses and uh, uh, remind yourself about that. But the current is gonna be essentially confined to this surface, so to the outer surface. And uh, if, we, if we, I mean, the, let me write the equation for a skin depths, it's gonna be delta a skin depths equal to a square root of two divided by omega mu sigma. So this is essentially your skin depths where omega is two pi f, mu is the permeability and sigma is the conductivity. Now, if I take this delta as my skin depths, I can assume that somehow this A that I have, the cross section that the current is path passing through is gonna be the multiplication of the circumference times, let's say, delta. So if you open this, if you open this very a small a circular a strip here, you're gonna essentially get this, where, the, where this is C and this is delta. So the area of this is C times delta. So, in, so you can substitute your A as C delta in higher frequency because in higher frequency, a skin depth would, be, would matter. So then I can just say R at higher frequency would be one divided by sigma L and instead of A, which was the whole cross section, I'm just gonna write C times delta. So this is gonna be my R at high frequency, which is gonna be one divided by sigma L C and delta was a square root of two omega mu sigma because it's one divided by delta becomes omega mu sigma divided by two. And you can write it as L divided by C and then bring sigma into the square root and then you get omega mu two sigma. So this becomes R at higher frequency. Let me check that I haven't made any mistake. So that seems to be that seems to be uh, correct. And now to, to have some sort of uh, idea, you can uh, look at one of the example in the textbook where they calculate this uh, uh, R at higher frequency. Remember, this is 
are due to loss. This is not uh, radiation resistance. So you can calculate that, but then one important thing about this is that this assumes that the current is uniform. So you can use that for infinitesimal dipole antenna very easily because we are assuming that the current is uniform on this antenna. When we go, for example, to other antennas, for example, half a wavelength uh, dipole antenna, we need to have a factor of half here because the current is not going to be uniform. It's going to be in this shape. So you're going to have a factor of half here. So you could write that for half a wavelength, your loss becomes half of this. So it would be half of LC omega mu to sigma. So that's essentially going to be your uh, RL, R of loss, uh, for half a wavelength. So this half a wavelength comes because with, with this antenna, the current is not going to be uniform, and that's the way that you're going to take that into account. So that would be our, our loss. And uh, let me make an example. And uh, this is an example from the textbook by Professor Balanis, Wiley textbook. So let me, let me, let me have this example. So let's assume that you're using copper and the conductivity of copper is 5.7. 10 to the power of 7. Remember the dimension of uh, conductivity is Siemens per meter. So that's my sigma. Uh, I'm assuming that my F is 100 megahertz. So this is my F frequency of operation. The radius of the wire B is taken to be 3 10 to the power of minus 4 times wavelengths. So this is the radius of the wire. And now you can calculate the R of loss for half a wavelength dipole antenna. For example, RL becomes half. And then remember your L is lambda divided by two. So you have half a wavelength dipole lambda divided by two. Your C circumference is two pi times radius B, which is three. 10 to the power of minus 4 lambda. That's our circumference. Then you're going to get your omega 2 pi f, so 100 megahertz, 100 times 10 to the power of 6, times mu. Mu is 4 pi 10 to the power of minus 7, divided by 2 sigma. 2 times sigma, which is 5.7 10 to the power of seven that you have here. Now, as you see, lambda will cancel here. So then you can calculate that. The textbook has the answer. So I'm just going to write that. And this becomes 0 0.3490. So that's the resistance due to ohmic loss. So this is uh, RL for half a wavelength dipole antenna. If you wanted to do this calculation for infinitesimal dipole antenna, then what would be the difference? You wouldn't have this half because that was uniform current and your L becomes very tiny. For example, you substitute L to be lambda by 50 for infinitesimal. So, and yet you wouldn't have this half. Now, when you have this RL, you can calculate radiation efficiency of half a wavelength dipole antenna. And I can just write it here. Radiation efficiency is defined as RR, RR plus RL. And that's going to be RR for half a wavelength was 73. 73 RL is 0.349. And this becomes equal to 99.52. So it's almost 99.5% radiation efficiency. You can convert that to dB by taking 10 log base 10, and that's going to be minus 0 0.02 dB. Remember, 0 dB, that essentially means 100% efficiency. So this is a slightly less than 0 dB, minus 0 0.02. So this is the situation that we have. 
uh, the textbook has uh, done this also for infinitesimal dipole that I explained how to find it. You can also find it, and but for the infinitesimal dipole, remember that radiation resistance was very uh, small, was about 0.30. So I have the exact things based on the textbook 0.3158. And if you calculate the loss would be 0.0279. So this is essentially uh, the situation for uh, the infinitesimal dipole antenna. Now, if you look at this infinitesimal dipole antenna and calculate uh, this radiation efficiency here, you see that this is a still very good. I think if I'm not mistaken, this is going to be also around 90%. So, uh, so if you do that, you still see a very big number and you might think that this is very efficient. But, but remember, you're missing something here. Again, this discussion doesn't take into account that you need to first give the power to the antenna, remember? you first give the power to the antenna and then you calculate radiation efficiency. So the discussion on radiation efficiency doesn't include this mismatch because if you have a mismatch, then power doesn't go well to the antenna. But this doesn't take into account. This assume that power has been given to the antenna, then find the ratio. So this is the impedance mismatch. You don't see that here either. So that's also uh, one thing I wanted to uh, uh, clarify. And uh, one more thing that I like to discuss is the uh, half a wavelength uh, dipole antenna. We mentioned something about that. And uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to expand on this a little bit more and then uh, and then you know why if you cut the half a wavelength dipole antenna a little bit, then you can make it a resonant antenna. So, so let me write the input impedance of half a wavelength. We said is about 73 plus J 42.5. So, and then if you cut it a little bit, for example, make it 0.48 lambda, for example, uh, then you can perhaps remove this and this becomes 73. And because then Z in doesn't have an imaginary part, we call it now the antenna is resonant. So that's our that's the way that people do. So if this is your half a wavelength dipole antenna, then you essentially cut a little bit from its top, cut a little bit from its bottom, and then you can remove this. So I want to discuss this a little bit so that we understand it better. So now to do that, let me let me go with the transmission line analogy. So this let's assume this is my transmission line, which is open circuit. I know that I make my dipole by evolving this open circuit into two arms like that. And then I have my uh, I have my uh, dipole antenna. Let's, let's, let's find Z in. So Z in is Z naught, Z naught plus J Z L tangent beta L, Z L plus J Z naught tangent beta L. Now I have this, but I know that my Z L, which is load is open circuit. So it's very large. So this is dominant, this is dominant. Therefore, it's going to be Z naught Z L divided by J Z L tangent beta L Z L and Z L cancel. If J comes to the numerator, it becomes minus J. So the final result becomes minus J Z naught tangent beta L. So this is going to be my Z in. Let me write it here. Z in becomes minus J Z naught tangent beta L. Now, if you look at this, you see that this is purely imaginary. It doesn't have a real part because real part comes due to two mechanisms. One of them is radiation. And because this is transmission line, this current and this current cancel the effect of each other. They're very close. So you don't have radiation resistance. 
And I also assume the transmission line is lossless. Therefore, I don't get a real part. So remember, the real part, which in this case is this, comes after bending. Now, this is my Z in. Now, if you look at this Z in, I want to correct my Z in a little bit. Remember, I use L as the length of the antenna. And the length of the antenna, when I bend this, would be this plus this. So to be consistent with the length of the antenna being L, each of them needs to be L divided by two. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this L divided by two here for the sake that when I'm making my antenna, I get L divided by two here, L divided by two here, and the total length would be L for me. So that's my Z in. Now, if you look at this Z in, I can go to this circle, famous circle that you know that this is tangent axis. So if you have a small angle, you see tangent starts from here. This is the positive side of tangent axis. If you have a small angle, your tangent is positive. So a small angle means your L is a small compared to wavelengths. Because remember, wave tangent of beta L divided by 2 is tangent of 2 pi lambda L divided by 2. 2 and 2 cancel. You get tangent pi L divided by lambda. So when L is a small compared to wavelengths, then what's going to happen is that you get a positive tangent based on that. You have a positive tangent here, Z in becomes minus J, so Z in is essentially capacitive. So in the, in the beginning for infinitesimal dipole antenna, a small dipole antenna, you end up with a capacitive component. But then you keep increasing your, you keep increasing your L, you keep increasing your length until you get to what? If you get total length, which is the dipole length, if you get it equal to lambda divided by two, what's gonna happen? If you get it to lambda divided by two, then you're gonna get lambda divided by two divided by lambda. This becomes half, this becomes tangent of 90 degree, tangent of pi divided by two. And what is tangent of pi divided by two? You see, you keep increasing the angles, tangent positive, more positive. When you get to 90, this does not intersect with tangent because they're parallel. So you would say tangent goes to infinity. So when L is half a wavelength exactly, tangent goes to infinity, therefore theoretically Z in goes to zero. Or I better write J times zero. So what does that mean? That essentially means after half a wavelength, your Z in doesn't have any J component. And this is fantastic for us because now we don't have a J component, then we bend the antenna, we get our radiation resistance, which is for example, 73 plus J zero. So this is in fact plus J zero. So we would say, okay, half a wavelength is wonderful because if you go half a wavelength, then uh, your tangent becomes infinity. The imaginary part of the transmission line is gone. But of course, this is just an approximation because when you bend, things might change even with the imaginary part. And we see that it changes. We actually see that after bending, this doesn't go to zero, but this essentially becomes plus J42.5. Now, when this becomes plus, what's the meaning of that? If this becomes plus, you see your Z in is approximated by this in, in the imaginary part. If this becomes plus, because we already have a negative here, that means tangent needs to be negative. So that essentially means you've passed this point and you came to this point here, and now your tangent is negative. So you see, if this point is your half a wavelength, but when you are half a wavelength, you're essentially, it seems you've passed this point, your tangent becomes negative, 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 you have a positive here. So we, we see that there is a little bit of discrepancy between this model that we have and the actual thing that we get. So to compensate for this, we would say, okay, now we are here. 
but we ideally want it to be here based on our model. So we want to go a little bit back. So that's why we cut a little bit of our, the length of the dipole antenna and make it 0.48 lambda. This way we can just get rid of this one and it becomes 73 ohm. So that's the explanation, intuitive explanation for why we, we need a little bit less than that. The other thing I want to mention is the radius of the wire. So the radius of the wire is going to affect the input impedance. We haven't discussed that here. Uh, the main reason that we haven't discussed that is that this half a wavelength dipole is the most common form of the dipole antenna for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is that half a wavelength is not very sensitive to the radius of the wire. So. Uh, this is one advantage of half a wavelength dipole antenna that is not too sensitive to the radius of the wire. So for a range of radius, you get similar performance. So this is an advantage, and that's why we haven't discussed that. Textbook has a plot that shows the performance with respect to the input impedance performance with respect to the radius of wire. So, so uh, to summarize my discussion here, half a wavelength dipole antenna is interesting for us. It has some features, but perhaps the most important of one is that it gives you a very good input impedance 73, and that you see that this 73 creates a good S11 or reflection coefficient, so you can deliver power to that. And uh, other things like it's not too sensitive to the radius of the wire, and the directivity is reasonable. Remember, it's not that you always want high directivity. Someone, sometimes you actually want less directivity because you don't know where you're going to receive your signal from. So you want to be sensitive to a, to a, a wide range of angles. So, but in some other application, you might desire a larger directivity. So don't think of as a small directivity as a bad thing necessarily. It depends on the application. So with that, we're going to take a look at a couple of slides in the textbook and we finish this lecture.